you all for coming. So some of you might know this, but I'm doing like a, a month right now where I'm off social media. I've been doing a lot of realizations on my own of how much time I spend on social media. And I want everyone to feel the torture that I felt. <laughs> because I think a lot of people don't know how much time they actually spend on their phones. So if you have an iPhone, pull up screen time right now. And I want all of you, one by one, to start saying how, much, how many hours you have spent on your phone on average every day this week. Four hours and 45 minutes. Five hours, 11 minutes. Seven hours and 46 minutes. Five hours and 50 minutes. Seven hours and 15 minutes. So much time that I turned it off. <laughs> How did we end up here? Were phones always meant to be taking up so much of our time? And why are they becoming more and more of a problem? Let's go back to the start of it all when Steve Jobs introduced the first ever iPhone. What Steve Jobs had in mind for the iPhone wasn't something that you depended on, but simply a device that you could listen to music and make calls from. But over the past 12 years, internet and social media usage has absolutely skyrocketed. Today, 3.4 billion people use social media every single day, and just in 2017, we spent on average over two hours per day on our social networks alone. Let that sink in for a second. Psychologists and therapists are noticing massive increases in anxiety and depression, partly because we're constantly filling every single second we have alone with time on our phones. And so a few weeks ago, I asked myself the question, as we've gained in connectivity, what have we lost? Time is the most valuable resource we possess. So it's so important that we pay attention to how much of our lives we trade for the various activities we allow to claim it. And so to finally make time for the daily habits that I know will significantly make me happier and healthier, I decided to take a more drastic approach. Okay, so the thing that has caused this entire situation was me realizing that I was spending way too much time on social media. Let's see what I have this week. I'm averaging three and a half hours per day on my phone. And this week I've already tried really, really hard to not use it. Four hours per day, that is 28 hours a week, which is, is this even possible? It's 60 days a year on my phone, 60 days. I have built my entire life on social media. It's my job and most of my friendships happen through social media these days. But I've decided that for the next 30 days, I'm gonna delete all my apps, all social media from my phone and see how that changes how I feel on a daily basis, how much time I have on my hands and how present I am in my daily life. Hello Instagram, I'm about to do a full digital decluttering. So I will be deleting Instagram for the next 30 days. To all my friends, you can reach me through text. And to all of you who don't have my phone number, I'm sorry, you won't be able to reach me. All right, here we go. Instagram, goodbye. YouTube, goodbye. Twitter, goodbye. Snapchat, goodbye. I'm officially off the main social media platforms that apparently take up about one to two hours of my day every day. So I don't know what I'm gonna do with all this time now. Maybe I should start reading some of these books that I've bought and haven't started. I'm excited and I'm scared and I wonder how many times I'm gonna like try to open this app today and then realize that it's not there anymore. Let the challenge begin. Hey guys, I've deleted social media. Good. Nobody cares, dude. What? You guys are supposed to like support me in this. I've been sending you so many cool surf videos. Yeah. What? Yeah, apparently a bunch of surfers have been hitting you up. Also, yeah. yeah, I got like a few DMs from girls saying that, oh, why is Thomas not responding? We've been hitting him up. You want to ask him yeah. out on dates and stuff. Dude. And then also Kelly Slater is trying to get in contact. Yeah, he said you can only do something within the next month, but you have to answer. I'm taking up surfing now, so I'm answering all my DMs from all the surfers and we're going to go shred. What? I think he can come, but we'll just coordinate the time through DM. It's like a big DM group. Just uh, check out. No, I think it's best that Thomas just stays on. <laughs> <laughs> but guys, <laughs> just 30 days, please. <laughs> All right, that is end of day two, but I have some good news. I logged onto my screen time and I've only spent an hour and 35 minutes on my phone today, which is two hours less than my average. Two entire hours less of my day was spent on my phone. The entire day, it's hard to record those moments, but I would pull out my phone and Instagram used to be down here and I would just like pull it out and press here and then realize, oh my God, what am I doing? Like, Instagram is not here. It's such a reflex. Every time I go to the bathroom, I sit down and I pull out my phone and I stare at it and I have literally nothing to do. So I just put it back in my pocket. It's pretty crazy to see already day two that I've saved two hours of my day from my phone. 
The most important thing I wanted to do this month was to live with intention. I hadn't had any kind of set routine of the past few months, so I wanted to use all the time that I saved from this experiment to live and create my dream morning routine. First, I'm deciding to wake up before I have to every single morning by getting up before 6 a.m. Okay, I struggled with that the first week, but I eventually adjusted my body to it. My goals were to reflect and journal every single day, keep my room clean and organized, and most importantly, start my day with a run or a surf. My reflex right now would be to pick up my phone and sit down and just start scrolling. I got no other choice but to like just pick up a book, do some reading instead. And social media is having some wild benefits. All right, cold shower. I then got the courage to hop in a cold shower, meditated for 15 minutes, and took some time to read. And already within two weeks, I genuinely felt my life changing. Well, it has officially been two weeks without any social media on my phone. I have decided officially that I will never go back to using social media the way I was using it before. Obviously, this is a very tough message for us to give because we're on social media. We have a YouTube channel and Instagram page and we have all sorts of things where we put content out. And we've kind of made it our mission to make sure that what we put out into the world has a reason for being there. I think that should be most people's goals with even how they use social media. It's important that you have a purpose when you're there and make sure that it doesn't ever replace real life conversations. And I gotta say, he's a completely different man now. This is the most change I've ever noticed on you. Uh-huh. Ever. <laughs> yeah. No social media has just allowed me to be so, a lot more focused, I feel like. No social media, a lot of meditating. It's all good. What he's saying is, 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 is good stuff and I will personally try it. So you should Thanks, try it man. As part of my month, I've been told that there's this community called Brick. There's like two stories of a bunch of people that show up and no phones allowed. I've been told that people that come to these things are here to really connect. It's one way to pass the time at night. Just going and connecting with a bunch of people. Let's see how it goes. So please take photos. I'm playing Taboo. I don't know what that game is. You, you get oxytocin during a fulfilling experience. Mm. And the problem with our phones is that dopamine is this endless searching neurochemical. The endless scroll is there's no satiation point. It's like candy. You can never quite feel full. Our goal with the Brick events is to give people meaningful connections, meaningful experiences in the real world, to give them that oxytocin so when they do go back to their phone, the, the candy isn't as attractive to them because they had a much more fulfilling experience in the real world. Thank you so much, Tom. Come on. Yeah, thanks for yeah. inviting come to phone-free events? Um, I just like finding like-minded people where we're all just having a great time, not distracted by all the bullshit that's been going on in our phone. We're living life right here, right now, not for the outside realm. It's so fun. Definitely coming back. Phone-free events is the way to go. Human interaction wow. <laughs> instead of phone interaction. After weeks of not using social media, I wanted to get an even better understanding of what was actually going on mentally. So we decided to contact the man who actually inspired this entire idea, Cal Newport. Cal is an associate professor of computer science at Georgetown University, and in addition to researching cutting edge technology, he's the author of six books, including the New York Times bestseller, Digital Minimalism. In his book, he challenges the audience to do what he calls a digital decluttering, which means deleting all the optional apps off your phone for 30 days, which is exactly what I did. He argues that we should be much more selective about the technologies we adopt in our personal lives. Naturally, given his stance on social media, Cal is incredibly hard to reach, but after weeks of emails, we're finally able to set up an interview with him at his home in Washington, DC. All right, we good to go? 
Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us, Cal. Of course, happy to do it. One question that I like to start with, do you think there's any benefits to social media? Well, I see it more broadly. What we have in the foundation is the social internet, which Mm -hmm. I think is just more generally the ability to use the internet, to connect with other people, express yourself, and find interesting ideas and information. That's incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. So where the problems are coming from, it's what happened at some point in the history of social media as an industry, where you had a small number of these companies that had a lot of venture capital backing them. And they were looking ahead to, we have to do our IPO. We have to get our 100X return to our early seed uh, investors. And so there's this period of re-engineering that started about seven or eight years ago, in which the actual experience of these apps was changed to try to induce you to use it a lot more. Hmm. And this is when we got the rise of likes and favorites and tags for photos. Because this changed the experience of social media from I'm posting, my friends are posting, to a vision where I hit this and I have social approval indicators waiting for me. Hmm. Then we coupled that with putting in very smart statistical algorithms Hmm. to start studying the users like data vectors and understanding what can we show them that's going to make them most likely to keep staring at the screen. Hmm. That was entirely for revenue purposes, which again is why we see the like button didn't exist and then suddenly it's everywhere. Hmm. Why? Because it gets you looking at your screen more and it gets you giving information about your preferences all day long, which Hmm. makes that data vector that does describes you to the marketers much richer. They can see what you're liking and, and, and what you're not liking. So what do you think some of the main things that we've lost by just having access to this constant, like you call it, it's a slot machine in your phone where you're yeah. always looking for what you've got. Right, and I have to say this, the slot machine analogy, which it was Tristan Harris, the sort of former Google engineer turned whistleblower. Mm. That was his analogy. Mm. Um, it's actually literal. The attention engineers working in Silicon Valley took uh, research that came out of Las Vegas Casino Gambling. No way. We're trying to understand how to re-engineer the social media apps on the phone so that you use them more. Both Facebook and Instagram would artificially batch likes or favorites to better match these reinforcement schedules. Hmm. So we don't want these to be trickled out too much. You're going to use this more compulsively if we actually hold these back. Hmm. So this time you see none, and then maybe we release them in a big bunch. The next time they're actually looking at the reinforcement schedules from slot machines. And so there's really three things that seem to be happening. One, when you do this all the time to fill all your downtime, it keeps you away from higher quality pursuit. So it's not that this is bad, but if you were instead, you know, out there with a friend training for the the half iron, man, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, that's much better. The second thing is a problem is what psychologists call social snacking, which is we have a drive to be social, mm-hmm. but a lot of people will replace real world interaction with this because this is easier. The problem is, is our brain doesn't recognize this the same way that it recognizes actually sacrificing time and attention on behalf of strengthening a connection, which is why we see these paradoxical studies where increased social media use correlates so strongly with increased loneliness. And then the third issue is we need solitude. Hmm. So we need on a regular basis, time alone with our own thoughts, not processing input from other people. Hmm. And if you get rid of every last moment of solitude by doing this every time you're bored, it's not good for the brain. And one of the side effects of this is anxiety, which is why I think we have the sort of low grade hum of anxiety in our culture right now that we all just take for granted. Is this is just the modern condition where really what it is is our brain's yelling out, I need time away from inputs. I can't always be processing inputs from other minds. I need to just look at the things around me and think, and I need to do that every day. And the interesting thing about hmm. discomfort, is that it's true that a lot of the things that are really important for human flourishing require some discomfort. So what was the s- solution from evolution to get us to still do them is we got these strong drives. Part of where we've gotten in the trouble today is that modern technologies have given us a way to short circuit those drives. So we have the strong drive, the sociality that's supposed to get us out there and do the hard work of being there and connecting with our community, our, our close friends and our family. But you can short circuit that drive by looking at Instagram or Facebook. But boredom is this powerful drive to get us out there to do high quality type of leisure activities or type of things that make us feel alive as humans. But you have these sort of very pleasing distractions on your phone and it can give you an immediate response to the boredom. It short circuits the drive. So we're short circuiting the drives that are supposed to push us into the discomfort, which is why I think like the type of work you're doing with Yes Theory is so important is that you have to essentially re-educate people about, hey, these things that are uncomfortable actually can be a source of real flourishing. Now, the internet can play a huge role boosting these very high quality activities. So Hmm. like, let's say I want a more high quality hobby. I'm into this maker culture. I'm going to build whatever. Well, the internet is great in the sense that it can connect you not just to other people who are working on it, but a lot of information about how to do this. But this is the internet at its best, is where it's supporting these high quality leisure activities that give us a huge return. Where it becomes at its worst is where it subverts them. It becomes a replacement. And now when you start adding the technology back, you get these sort of really 
well-balanced lives where like you're predominantly spending your time doing things that are quite meaningful and then you're strategically deploying tech giving you these little boosts and supports for this life of values you built just to wrap this up i want the, the connection that we made that was the most interesting to me was that when we're bored we used to have the motivation to go do things what we have to be careful of is being aware of not feeling that boredom constantly with social media because it might actually reduce our motivation to go out and create and do more things if you feel an instinct that's been around for a long time be wary of fulfilling it with something that's been around for 10 years. Thank you so much, Cal. Thank you. This has been super interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. My pleasure. It was great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Of course, yeah. <sighs> All right. It is officially April 3rd, which makes it more than 30 days without social media. It's been an incredible experience. I honestly don't really miss it, which is a little bit strange, I guess. I thought I would miss it more at this point. I'm like really not looking forward to it. Like I've saved so much time and it hasn't caused any real inconveniences. Overall, this month honestly changed my life. 30 days ago, I was honestly not in the best headspace. Whether you could see it or not at the start of this video, I was anxious on a daily basis. I didn't feel like I was actively pursuing any of the goals I'd set for myself this year and I never felt like I had any time for myself. But in this month that at first just started as an experiment, I ended it feeling more alive, more present, and fulfilled than I ever had in my entire life. There were several times throughout the day where I'd stop and catch a breath of fresh air just to appreciate how calm I felt. At the end of the day, for me, the main reason why I love doing what we do is because every single time we go through an experience like this one, we always come out on the other side feeling like an evolved version of ourselves. Moving forward, I've decided that I'm permanently going to keep social media off my phone and just download it every three days for 20 minutes and do all the things I need to do, then delete it back. I'm going to continue experimenting with my usage to see what works, but one thing is for sure. Now that I've seen the other side, there's no freaking way that I'm going back to my old ways. And now I challenge you to make a list of all the things that you've been wanting to pursue but just haven't had time for. Then delete social media off your phone for seven days and replace the time you saved by pursuing one or several of those things for a week. Coming from someone who just did this, I promise you it'll change your life. I want to end this by thanking you for watching this episode and if you're interested in exploring this topic more in depth, we got our sponsor Audible to give you guys an exclusive 30-day free trial and a book of your choice for free. I'd recommend Cal Newport's Digital Minimalism, which partly inspired this video and taught me how to better balance social media into my life, making me happier and less anxious ever since. Plus, with Audible, you get one free audiobook and two free Audible originals every month from their constantly changing list, which has allowed me to listen to more books on the go. Every time we travel, I download a bunch of books to listen to, which saves me from having to pack my bags to the brim with hardcover ones. If you're interested in learning how to control social media use, then you can go find Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport on audible.com slash yes theory or text yes theory to 500 500. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next week.